Good morning, good evening, and welcome to our regular Monday uh, discussion group. Today I'd like to answer a question that sometimes people have, and that is that from time to time we meditate and we wonder, as this especially may occur with people who begin meditation, and they, and I'm assuming all of you are, or at least certainly the vast majority of you who are tuning in this evening are meditators, but we wonder, I wonder, is this changing me in any way? I mean, is it really doing any good? A person might uh, have that fleeting thought, and why should I continue doing this? And so these, these sorts of things. And I'd like to answer that by telling a story about a study that was done some years ago. And I've always enjoyed this, and it's I think it maybe was seven or eight years ago this study was done. And I read it, and it passed through my mind, and I rec recollected it a couple of days ago. And the fellow, I was a psychologist, and so many of these stories are, and he was doing a study, and he himself was, uh, is, he's still a meditator. And he uh, was trying to measure, does meditation actually make any change in people? Does it, you know, in some objective way? And so how, so he designed a study with his uh, colleagues, his, his, he was a professor, and so his graduate students and he designed it in such a way that they, enlisted volunteers. Uh, I assume this must have been at a university, but they enlisted volunteers and they and they put an ad in various uh, places, newspapers perhaps, or bulletin boards, and they received replies from, I believe it was 39 people volunteered. And so they asked them to come in to, and they wanted to, and they told them they were going to be at a study, and they were they asked them to meditate for an eight, take an eight week course of meditation. And the one of the criteria for this eight week course was that they had to pledge to actually practice, and they, you know, they, and to come in, and that they would come to once a week, they would, it would be a guided course, and then during the week, they had mentors who would call them up to make sure that they were doing it and answer any questions so that they would go. Now, they broke, the, they, what they did is they took two groups of, they split it into two. And the one group was of 20. And these were the ones that they said, you're the ones that are actually going to be taking this class. And the, the other group of 19 that were remained, they said, well, we're going to sign you up We'll keep in contact with you, but uh, we're going to sign you up and put you on the waiting list. And so they they put these two groups together, and they be, the one took the class, and the other didn't. And then after the eight week course, what they did is they said, "Well, we want to now test you to come in to our laboratory to test you to see how you have changed, if you've changed." And they implication was in which they actually did they came in and they measured their blood pressure and did various testing and so on so it seemed to be a very in which they gathered data for it which they were interested in but they subjects didn't realize that the real test that was going to be done was before they actually hooked these uh, students up or volunteers up to the equipment. And it was designed like this. The, 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 they would come to the laboratory and, and there would be a waiting room where outside where they would be asked to wait before they were able to be tested. And in this waiting room, there were uh, three chairs that were set up in the waiting room. And have in, in two of those chairs would be occupied by uh, two, you know, two people that actually were part of the testing team, but they appeared to be people who were waiting to be tested. And one chair was open so that uh, 
when a person came in, when a new you know person to be tested, they each were at a certain time, they were signed up to come in. When that person came in, they walked into the into the waiting room. And there were only there was only one empty chair because the other two and the other two were you know occupied you know you know with their uh, perhaps reading or s scrolling through their iPhone or whatever it was looking checking their email and uh, so the person that would come in to be tested would would see only one open chair so what they would do naturally they would sit in the third chair so now all three chairs were occupied. And then after a minute or so, there would, uh, you could hear down the hallway, the elevator would, uh, would uh, stop and out of the elevator would come a, a person who was, and they could hear this person on crutches coming down the hallway and they would, uh, they would enter in and this would be a, uh, a young lady or, or young fellow wearing a, uh, orthopedic boot on their leg as if they had broken their uh, their ankle or severely twisted their ankle and this person would come in in on crutches into the room and they would come in and they would look and they would see that there's no chair there and they would then make their way to the other side of the room, uh, waiting room and they would lean against the wall and kind of give a Oh, oh, a little bit, a little audible sound that, you know, their foot was hurting and that, and they would then, you know, lean there against the wall. Now, the three people noticing would notice the person entering and the two that had been planted there would immediately just start going back to what they were doing. And the test subject uh, was faced with this situation. What do I do? Now, this person has come in obviously in distress. I'm here. And they were measuring to see how often that third person would get up and offer their, because this person was in crutches in distress, to offer their seat to that third person. Well, the other two who were better ready, they had gone back to whatever they were doing, totally disregarding everything. And they invited different. They invited their test subjects in it, but they invited also the ones who had not taken the meditation course. You see, they were invited in too, to be taken to now be tested preliminarily to taking the next course. So, what happens? Fellow comes. You know the uh, they measured and of all you know all forty of these or thirty nine of these subjects come in. Those who had not taken the meditation course, randomly selected out of those, they responded, 16% of those got, got up and helped the other person, gave their chair to the other person who was in distress. But after an eight week course in which none of this was referred to at all, 50%, three times actually, as many people, after simply a eight week course, there was a threefold increase of the subjects got up and allowed that person who was in distress to have their seat. Now, on the one hand, you might look at this situation, say, you mean only 50%, what did the other 50%, they just sat there? Well, yes, you could look at it in the from the glass half empty point of view. But if you look at it from the other side, three times as many people after simply an eight week course of practicing meditation had developed some difference in them as compared to those who did not meditate to actually get up and help that person and do something. And this, uh, and then after this was, they all then went in and were subjected to other testing as well. So they were told, you see, about what was really being measured here. One of the many things that were being measured was this level of empathy to be able to make a difference in their behavior. Now, you might say, well, what 
is that a big deal? Yes, it is quite a big deal. Now, the, the, to see that how meditation will actually change somebody, not just what we're speaking about, oh, meditation, um, it makes me more kind or it makes me, or inwardly, it makes me more calm, it's going to give me success and all of these more obvious things that sometimes I can concentrate better and all of these things, it actually changes a person's behavior. Now, the researchers did not uh, go into, or actually they didn't really, in their, they wrote a research paper about this, they didn't really know why. They were going, could only speculate, why did meditation change a person in that way? And they had a couple of theories that, that were going on and observations after, you know, doing this enough, because this was replicated. This is not, you know, they've replicated this number of times. Why does it what, why does it have this effect? Well, there's a number of different things. It, you could, one of the things they, they thought, well, one of it is it makes a person, and they thought about this, well, maybe it makes a person more observant. In other words, you can see, uh, you know, you, you, and this is true, what meditation does is we tend to become more aware, you might say, more in a conscious state. Whereas, you know, when a person is spending their time on their on their phone, scrolling through uh, the internet or email, and you, you see this a lot, people are this way on the go on the metro and, and in daily behavior, it's just people are engaged there. They're not very observant of what's going on around us. You're not, you're not really in a state of awareness. Now, people are thinking that, oh, I'm getting all this information. This is somehow expanding my sense of awareness for all this data. But that's not the same thing as being aware to being observant. And it has been demonstrated in other studies that meditation does make a person observant. They, they're brought into a conscious state and they maintain that sense of conscious awareness through their daily activities in a much more uh, dynamic way than being lost in their own thoughts, you might say. And so this could have been one of the effects of it. Uh, but it's also, but it's also been demonstrated. Another reason is that when people meditate, they tend to feel a sense of uh, interconnectedness. When we meditate, we somehow the result is that uh, uh, the sense of, well, if people suffering, we're all in this together. And it's been noted that when people have a sense of, of uh, group suffering, we're all suffering together, like they're put under traumatic circumstances or stressful circumstances, or you could say in, in warfare, we're all in this, we're all in this foxhole together. It builds a sense of connectedness and tend people when they feel in some sense of connectedness to other people, they're naturally going to be empathetic in their behavior to other people. And they know that meditation does do this as, as well. They're all suffering together. But in a sense, it doesn't really matter. Well, I guess it matters, but it doesn't matter immediately to this. Our question here is why a person became empathetic. But the fact of the matter, it is that it, it, it happens. And it's also been speculated, the research has speculated that one of the impacts of meditation is that a person is able to gain a sense of uh, self-control on themselves. And, and people often think, well, yes, as I mentioned, my cognitive abilities will improve and my focus will improve, but those in a sense are secondary results, you might say, and it's all, they're good, but they're, you know, what I can, what I can get out of life and maybe be more efficient. Yes, we want to meditate for those reasons, but they're secondary. And one of the primary things to that happens is we begin to feel a sense of empathy and compassion begins to grow. And there's a direct relationship between meditation, compassion, empathy, and self-control. You see, we don't think in terms, we, we learn to be able to control ourselves. In, and those three 
are related. And by self-control, it means that we gain control to be able to, to, to act in a way, consciously act. And we overcome what is in psychology referred to as the bystander, bystander effect. You know, it's, unfortunately, it's one thing has been noted that if you're on the street, let's say, is and uh, there's an accident, so, or something, somebody collapses on the street and is obviously in a difficult state, that if you're the only one on the street, and that happens, and you're by yourself, there is a, you're more likely to help that person. But if there are other people around, what you do the tendency is for individuals to not act so readily, not to be the first one to act. The fact of being in a group inhibits a person to doing what they would normally do if they were by themselves. Because you stand back and you say, "Is," and you look to other people, what are they doing? And you take your cue, not from what you feel inwardly is the right thing to do, or the, but you take your cue from what other people do. Now, there's probably some biological, socially evolutionary reason for that, but you can and you hear these stories about somebody's really in distress and nobody steps forward to help that person. They just stand back and watch, or even worse yet, they get out their mobile and start taking a picture of it rather than actually doing something. Well, <laughs> there's lots of stories like that, but when they found that when a person meditates, they a person is more likely to do inwardly what they feel is the appropriate thing to do. They that bystander effect begins to minimize, and they act from within rather than acting from the pressures that they might feel from without. And the reason is, it doesn't mean that uh, they do foolish things; it's they are aware. They, ha they have self-control. They can control from their inner self rather than from the outer. And so this ability to self-control is extremely important. Now, I'm going to come back to the original study, but it reminds me of a second study that was done uh, of inmates in a maximum security prison. So these people that were, these fellows that were in the prison were Obviously, uh, you know, they were, they had gone wrong. Something had gone wrong with them in their life. And they did a, a study of meditation, getting volunteers who wanted to volunteer. And they found that one of the, they measuring them before and after. And one of the effects that meditation had on these prisoners was it helped to gain them this ability to control their emotional impulses. And that was one of the things that people that are in prison who for who commit crimes is they there's a tendency they lack uh, impulse control. So they get angry and they they don't stop to consider the consequences often. They between the emotional stimulus and the response whether it's a good response or a bad response, the timing is kind of very short. But after meditation, learning to meditate, very subtly, they begin to gain control of their impulses. Again, this is coming back to self-control. But one of the ones we're talking about here is the ability to control oneself also leads to a sense of empathy. And I think this is what happens, whether it's, uh, for whatever the reason is, let's say, you do see this development of empathy, of compassion. And compassion is, is that sense of feeling of, of action, of actually doing something. But to, before you can do it, you have to feel it. And so you could say that meditation somehow, it takes time, but here this was only an eight-week study. Imagine if you continue to make that your way of life. Uh, it's an aspect of love and it's an aspect of it. It stimulates that natural feelings of energy. It's stimulating that heart center within it in some subtle way. 
to make to the result being that we feel a sense of unity with other people. We feel other beings, you could say, are we, we begin to break down that barrier that is often uh, often there. And you could say it's it softens those barriers and you or maybe you you're able to uh, put yourself in someone else's shoes. Oh, there for the grace of God, go I. Uh, and, and or you begin, you know, you then you that empathy gives rise to compassion, which is the action of to again taking an old saying, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And you overcome this this bystander effect, and you think we're all in this together. The impulse to when you see suffering. You uh, moderate it, whether it be in yourself or whether you you uh, apply that to others, and it starts to become something natural. Now, I mentioned this um, because I one, it's not consciously having to be developed. In other words, it's something natural. You could say the natural is going back to what Sri Teshwar said we begin to develop the natural love of the heart. We stimulate it somehow. We don't have to know how or why it does, other than the fact that it does. But of course, if we cooperate with these tendencies, if we cooperate with this natural process that happens when we start to become more aware, we, become, we start to feel a sense of, we become more empathetic. If we cooperate with that, well, then think how much more this can be developed. And so consequently, you have in the meditation process, uh, in the meditation techniques of consciously trying to project uh, that sense of compassion out to others, using part of that time of, of, of not... Uh, you know, thinking just only what is in this for me, but how can I be a channel for a larger energy outward and this sense of unity that begins to come. And we allow that to happen and it begins to happen. Now, the byproducts of this is yes, we can help other people, but we begin to break down that sense of division that is the root cause of much of our suffering. It's not about the suffering of the other people. It has something to do with it, yes. But it breaks down the propensity for us in this world to suffer because suffering is ignorance. Comes is a, is It's the natural result of ignorance. And ignorance is the consequence of not understanding our larger unity with this world as a whole. It's this sense of ego identity is what I'm saying. Ego identity that separates us. Now, ego has its rightful place, but that consequence of it being a separating factor leads us to thinking of ourselves first as somehow different from everything else, separated from everything else, and eventually this leads to suffering. And so consequently, when we take the opposite tact in life, direct our energy otherwise, we find that that begins to minimize. And in some mysterious way, we don't even have to know how this is happening. We begin to find that we begin to empathize and we begin to feel better about ourselves. And so you could say there's a direct correlation between meditation, how or why, we perhaps we don't know, and the consequences of it, which is we feel better. And we feel more, you might say, we develop more maturity, which is defined as, and particularly spiritual maturity, is defined as, is defined as an ability to relate to the reality of others, putting ourselves in other shoes. And when we understand that, or when we do that, when we develop that ability to relate 
to a larger reality other than our own small one, we find that our consciousness, our awareness in, increases. We see things in a totally fresher way. And the material consequences are, of that are that we tend to be more successful in life. We tend to because uh, we have a broader perspective. We're more able to solve problems. We're able, and the side effects of meditation, these other ones that often the reasons people take up meditations, you know, in the, the corner, uh, how to meditate course, because it's going to, they're going to gain something, uh, peace of mind or something valuable for them. They come naturally. And so this is something we want to take in mind with our own, in our own way. Now, I mention this is because we have to, we often want to, we should look within ourselves. If Are we developing that quality? I think what it really is, is the energy begins to flow in the spine and it begins to stimulate that flow, natural flow begins to, upward flow begins to stimulate uh, the heart chakra and, and, and these consequences, results come out of that. But we do have to ask ourselves, are, is this happening within me? Because yes, 50% of those test subjects helped other people. But if you take the opposite point of view, the glass is only half full, what about the other 50%? Well, I think not to be critical of them, it just takes time. Eight weeks, you know, some people are primed for it temperamentally, you see. Some people are on the, you know, just a little bit of a push, a little bit of awareness, a little bit of a meditation, even a little bit will save you from dire fears and colossal sufferings is, uh, you know, in the words of the Gita and Krishna in the Gita. And this is you practice the little bit of Kriya, you find yourself changing quickly. Because I think most people who come to the spiritual path, people who come to uh, want to take up these sorts of things, they're already, they've reached a point where they're ready for that. But they're still, that if they go on, and perhaps first you take up these exercises, you take up Kriya, you do this because of your, your want, you just, your maybe, your motivations are a little bit sort of um, uh, uh, spiritually on the commercial side. You want, I'll do this and retain for that. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's fine. It's whatever it takes to get a person going because these other things are going to develop naturally. So you could say maybe those people that after eight weeks, they responded quickly, they were primed for it, but the other half, it will come. It'll come. It's just a matter of taking a little bit of time. And I think this is something all of us really, we want because one of the, I think one of the, you might social diseases of the modern age. And I think again of those people that are all in, they're engrossed in their screens there's also a great deal of alienation in today's modern world. You see, you know, the one of the complaints that people have is they feel alone. They feel that they don't have friends. Uh, they don't. They can't make connections. They have. To, they have a difficulty in all of these different, you might say, social ways. And they're, you know, young people growing up. I think we all, you know, those of us who go back and remember when we were teenagers. You know, there's a, some are just the life of the party and then they have lots of friends seemingly outwardly. Then, But I think all of us as we're growing up and we see that we're, we begin to realize as we become aware, as we grow into adults, that there's a certain loneliness there too, that we're alone and the need for friends is something that comforts that sense of awakening awareness of our individual place in this universe, this this cosmic challenge that's presented to all of us. And at first, it can be very socially and, and intimidating to us. What do I do? Who am I? Where do I? What's this life all about? All of these questions and that come up and how can I have friends and how can I 
you know, relate to other people more successfully. And we see that that's really the important thing for us. We think that these outward things of career and, and material success are what we're striving for. But we find that if we develop those inner qualities of compassion, empathy, the ability to make friends, the ability to be joyful inside, even when we're alone and by ourselves, we find that these are the truly important things for us and the important things which we're looking in life. But the positive thing to understand is if we develop these qualities, everything else follows because our ability to be successful inwardly inevitably allows us to be successful outer, outwardly if that's our interest, you see. Not everybody's interested in these things, but if we're, wherever our interests are, we develop these inner heart qualities first, then everything else will follow. So I think this is, uh, I I'm brought this up because I want us to know that whether we notice it or not, these changes are happening to us if we practice these techniques of meditation, if we practice, uh, especially if we practice Kriya, if we do these things, because that's Kriya is working very directly on this energy, passing this energy and passing it upward and awakening begins to take place in there, even if we don't notice it, but it's going to, it's going to be happening. And so I'd like to leave it at that. And since I have a, few extra, I uh, haven't gone beyond my half hour too much. I'd like to open it up if there's any questions. And I'm going to go here to the chat box first and start with, uh, start with the chat box and see if there was, uh, oh, the name of the study says, please share the source and name of the study. And I will, I will, but I'm going to have to go into my computer here well and so hold on just a second and I think I can find the name of that hold on hold on okay let me look here okay where is it where is it uh, oh okay hmm I'm going to it's de santo you know what am I going to see here? Uh, I'm going to have to just take a moment and go on to Google and type in uh, Well, I don't, okay. I don't have it immediately. I will find, because I'm going to have to look it up. But uh, I will find it. And I will bring it with me next week when we do this again next week. I will have that. So, okay, I'll go on. Uh, does dealing with people compassionately speed up spiritual progress? Uh, you know, it does. And this is, a, again, this is what I'm, I'm saying here, is that it's a natural consequence of spiritual development. But many things are the natural consequence of spiritual de development. Let's just say uh, a concentration. Is a, is a natural consequence of spiritual development, greater awareness. But if we practice what the consequences are consciously, then it helps enhance it. So consequently, compassion develops. But if we, or you could at least say, remove the obstacles for it. If not, you know, so let's take, and I think that might be better because some of these things are subtle. So let's just say empathy and compassion. How might we develop those? Well, I've said meditation here, but you could say in daily life, if we realize the blockages to those are uh, uh, individual egoic self-absorption, well, then you could sort of say, well, how can I remove that self-absorption to that and pay attention 
to, uh, to what's going on around me, become more observant of what's going on around me and try to project uh, compassionate feelings. And of course, this is the essence. If you any of you have knowledge of the Buddhist tradition, of course, this is the very essence of Buddhist tradition is to, is to the overcoming of compassion as the Buddha was and overcoming of suffering uh, you know, through compassion with, is one of the central practices to that. And so absolutely the answer is yes to that. And uh, compassion wells up, but I have spe seen people misbehaving because they think, uh, think we will not react when someone behaves bad with us. How long should we be compassionate? Because many times it just spurs them on. You know, life is a mixture. You can't, don't think, you're not, you're not being compassionate to others to change them. That's not the point. That's not the point. Compassion in, is in and of itself a healing practice of the heart for ourselves. And to the degree that you're going to change others, well, that's a that's a side effect, but it may happen or it may not happen. It's to be compassionate. If let's say if you don't want to be compassionate to others, be compassionate to the world as a whole. As if don't personalize it too much. Be compassionate to life. Be compassionate to the birds and the dogs and the in your pets, you know, and or whatever. It's compassion is something more than just that narrow focus of it. It's, it's an attitude toward life of putting yourself, feeling others real to be able to understand others realities. Look at it that way to understand those realities. It's not necessarily even something that, you know, other people need to be aware of that you're trying to do anything. It's a, it's a perspective on life and it, what the actions that come out of that, are whatever they are. They're not they they lead to a different approach to life. Not so it's not measured by the actions you take. Uh, although that it will affect to some degree, but it's your it's 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 an inner uh, approach, as I would say, to to life. And you'll find that you change. You begin to change, and as you change, circumstances around you change. Those other people change. You know, other people misbehave and you just have to accept that. And if you can help them, you help them. But even if you cannot physically help some other people because they're not, they're not open to it, it's their choice. You can from a distance, you can pray for people. There's, this is the one freedom. Well, now I probably could think of more than one, but I know this one for a fact. You have one freedom. You can love other people or you can choose not to love other people. There's nothing that is preventing you except yourself from projecting love from your heart to other people, to the situation, to the love of the world itself. And when you choose to love, your life will change. And maybe the world will change a little bit too, but that's not the reason. Uh, it, it's you will change and your whole consciousness will change. And that's the freedom you have in the worst of situations. Christ on the cross, persecuted people in the Colosseum being eaten by those lions. You know, and I, I mean, I'm not saying put yourself in those situations at all, but at the, in the direst of situations, we always have a choice to be angry or to love. What are we going to do? I think if you're a devotee, if you don't have, you know, you can either think up or you can be angry and go out of this world with that state of consciousness at the last moment when you're, you know, you're exiting, what's your state of mind going to be? And it's going to determine what happens next. It just, that alone ought to be a motivating factor. Anyway, you get the idea. <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. Okay. Uh, but if compassion is the last one said, if it does well up, that's a good thing. A good thing. Don't block it. I and mean, it's not going to hurt you. It's going to probably make you uh, do the right thing. There was a movie years ago and under with that title, Do the Right Thing. And uh, I think that's what we all want to do. <laughs> anyway, blessings to all of you. I'll see you next 
Monday, and I will bring the title of that article with me. Joy to you.